The first title is the more methodological of the two, and the second is for those more interested in, in applications, and I'll, I'll discuss both in the course of the presentation. I'd like to acknowledge uh, my industry partner, Axelos. Uh, in particular, my co-authors in this talk are Feng He and Loin Goen in the Vietnam uh, office, and also in uh, Boston, David Knezevich. Uh, I should emphasize that Axelos is a company that licenses technology that was developed in my research group over the past 10 years, uh, but that uh, I myself, I have no financial interest uh, in Axelos, but I do have a great deal of intellectual interest in seeing what the software can do given uh, many years of research. My academic collaborators are on this list for this particular talk, in particular Catherine Smetana and Masayano. Again, neither of these two collaborators or any of these collaborators has any financial interest uh, in the Axelos uh, software company. And my sponsors, in case they're here or even if they're not. So first, uh, parameterized partial differential equations. I will go from the, uh, I will describe a general setting, but let me start with some specifics which will inform the uh, applications and illustrations that I give today. Acoustics. The pressure is a function of linear acoustics. Pressure is a function of space and time. It is given uh, by the real part of the product of the frequency domain pressure, u, and a complex exponential where f is frequency, uh, and we will use uh, units of hertz. Uh, the frequency domain pressure satisfies the well-known Helmholtz equation, uh, and uh, you can see here this is the undissipative term, this is the slight dissipation. Together they form a kappa, which is essentially very close to one. Uh, and you have the term here, which represents the time uh, harmonic uh, behavior. This is the wave number squared, uh, and will play a central role, essentially a non-dimensional frequency. And uh, one over two pi over k is the wavelength of the uh, wave. And uh, so this is the equation of departure for many of the applications that I will show. Uh, what is the difference between that equation and a parameterized PDE? Well, uh, all we need do is explicitly identify the parameters of interest in any particular PDE. So for Helmholtz acoustics, I would choose the wave number k and parameters lambda related to the geometry. I can then introduce the map, which is central to this talk, which is the map from input parameter mu, k, and geometry to the field, which depends on the parameter, as well as any quantities of interest, say scalars, which also depend on the parameter. More abstractly, we have a parameter in a compact parameter domain, a p-tuple, if you like. The field, u mu, uh, satisfies the weak form. Uh, the output then is a linear function applied to the field. And of course, the parameter makes its way from the weak form through the field and then through the linear functional and finally to the output of interest. Right? So that's the, the highly uh, nonlinear map between parameter and output, even if, of course, the equation itself is linear in the field variables. So what do I mean by a model? A model is a particular problem definition, particular parameterization, a spatial domain, which may depend on the parameter, a physical discipline, in our parlance, a PDE, if you like, and engineering outputs that may be relevant. And a model is this, uh, a model essentially maps the parameter to the field and output, as I just described. A family is a set of models which share a common discipline in engineering context. So you could have a family of acoustic ducts, which could be anything from musical instruments to uh, audio equipment to mufflers. You could have a family of elastic shafts. You could have a family of historic structures. And I'll give brief examples of the latter two and extensive examples of the first. What is a PDE app? The app here is originally application, as, as Caroline uh, indicated. But these days, of course, an app has another connotation. It's intended to be a very simple, at least on the surface, piece of software which provides instantaneous gratification. All right? And so that's the use in which we uh, use the term uh, here. So a PDE app is software associated to a model which maps any parameter mu associated with that model to an approximate field and an approximate output, the tildes here uh, indicate approximate, uh, again, both parameterized, subject to performance requirements befitting of an app, or at least the connotations associated with an app. 
And since this is also intended to be a scientific inquiry, they don't have to just be fast, they have to be also, to a certain extent, correct. All right? And so there are uh, requirements on both. And here they are, there are four fives. Uh, a deployed PD app should satisfy five second problem setup time, how long it takes to say what you'd like to solve, five second problem solution time of the PDE, the field and the outputs, 5% solution error, specified metrics, and five second field visualization time of the full three dimensional field. The choice of five seconds, uh, of course, everything has to be non dimensionalized. So, where does five seconds come from? Five seconds comes from roughly the human attention span, all right, it's because these are intended to be interactive. Those of you that teach probably think I'm being a little generous with the five seconds, but uh, in any event, uh, five seconds is a reasonable order of magnitude for how long you might be able to amuse uh, uh, somebody. All right, so what is the model, what is the paradigm behind the PDE app? Of course, there are cases where the equation is simple enough that, that classical techniques uh, implemented in a, an efficient fashion can uh, meet those requirements, but very often not. So uh, we will pursue a model reduction paradigm, and ultimately I will fill out this acronym, though I do not expect you to remember it. Uh, so there are actually uh, two stages, offline and online. Let me omit this for the time being. The offline stage is very slow, takes days, and for a given family, we form an online data set D. Then in the online stage, which is very fast seconds, given a PD app, we evaluate the input parameter to field and output map by virtue of this pre-stored online data set. Now, of course, you can only justify days in exchange for seconds if you're going to be using this same app many times, the many query context, or if there's an imperative on interaction. All right? So these are the two contexts in which you can justify the offline in terms of the online. There is actually a second offline stage, which is more related to software. That is where we go from a family to a particular model and actually script the app which is then uh, on a server, which is uh, the, essentially the software we appeal to in this online stage. So offline, online, and we will exploit model uh, reduction. All right, computational methodology. Uh, first, the perspective in terms of genetic lines. Uh, essentially, the methods I'm describing here are not new. Uh, they combine effectively two streams. The first stream is component mode synthesis. Uh, which dates back uh, almost half a century. Uh, and from this uh, stream, we take the fundamental idea of component to system synthesis. The second stream is the reduced basis method. And from this stream, we take the notions of uh, model order reduction for parametric systems. So here's where the parameter enters in a central fashion. Uh, these two uh, streams have been combined before, most notably in the early 2000s by Yvonne Day and Einar Ronquist. And so what I'm describing today is one particular variation on the general theme of reduced basis element methods, which combine components and model order reduction for parameterized systems. And there are detailed references at the conclusion. So first, component and system synthesis. I will need to introduce a few bits of nomenclature which have very obvious uh, interpretations. Uh, and as I'm describing uh, these various pieces, you can think of a set of virtual Lego blocks, all right? And then I think most of these uh, concepts will become uh, rather clear. The first concept is a parametrized archetype component from which we will manufacture other components, instantiated components, in the image of this archetype component. So I show here a bend. You see it in the background. This is for an acoustics collection. There is a reference spatial domain and a reference finite element mesh. The archetype component also has two ports. You see port one. Port two is on the dark side of the moon on the other side. Uh, so associated also with this bend, another attribute is the finite element mesh. Uh, details of the ports in terms of what type of port and the mesh. Uh, critically also, though, uh, we associate to each archetype component a set of local parameters to that component, new, which must reside in a parameter domain curly V. So for example, the angle of sweep is a parameter, as is the ratio of radii and also the uh, wave number. And uh, we have mapping functions that I'll introduce later, but also, of course, we must say uh, what physics this archetype component is intended to simulate, and in this case, it's the equations of acoustics. So this is an archetype component. The key points are spatial domain, reference mesh, uh, and ports, as well as local parameters. We then form a library of these archetype components. So this is the library of acoustic ducts 
components. In fact, it's only a selection. There are about 20 or 25 components in all. And in each case here, I show you the uh, actually reference finite element mesh for the component. And I also indicate, either in red or yellow, the ports of this component. And it is through the ports that we will combine the components in order to form the systems in an obvious fashion. Admissible connections are by ports of common color, which refer to a common port type. So for example, any of these red ports, these components can be connected. Similarly, uh, these yellow ports uh, can be uh, connected. And there could be many different port types in this particular collection. There are two port types, or if you like, fiducial uh, ports. So how do we synthesize a model, or how do we synthesize a system which relates to a model? This is an exponential horn. Uh, don't be uh, confused by this dome. That's not part of the horn. That's actually a hemisphere in which we apply radiation boundary conditions out to infinity. So the horn is characterized by an initial length, the exponent of the horn, the ratio of mouth to throat, and finally the uh, wave number, and they must reside in this particular domain. So this is a model, a model parameter, and a model parameter domain. So how do we synthesize that? Well, we take an inlet component from our little set of Legos, and we put it right here. We take three channels, which we put here, here, and here. Uh, we then take about 12 exponential uh, horn components, each of which have different local parameters to form the horn. And finally, we take this uh, hemispherical radiation bubble. So uh, in this first stage, we have now instantiated the archetype components into a set of components which can create uh, the necessary uh, uh, system. In the second stage, the local port pairs, indicated here in red, coalesce into global ports because they are compatible by construction. And we have now formed the model. I should emphasize that mu is the model parameter, which then induces in each component a associated local parameter value nu so as to create the system. So the local parameter values are different in each component. So the archetype can instantiate uh, different shapes through the parametric uh, variation. So that's how we form a typical uh, model from components. And you can now actually define more precisely what we mean by a model. A model is essentially all possible component uh, combinations subject to the fact that you need to combine or connect only ports that uh, derive from a similar port type or fiducial port. Uh, this is actually, a, there's a horn inside here. It's a Nguyen phone created by Loy just as an illustration of flexibility. It's actually quite close to a, a prototype for a bass clarinet. The only thing I want to emphasize is these actually are, are holes in the side of the instrument. And one of the parameters is, is the hole open or closed? So that's a topological variation that's actually captured by the parameter. And that corresponds to replacing one component with another component. So you can have highly nonlinear system definition associated with these different uh, models. And we have actually, in fact, synthesized music, not for this particular uh, instrument, but clarinets uh, based on the techniques I'll describe today. So uh, the next step is finite element approximation, which is standard, except then I will make it more complicated. Uh, the uh, first issue is geometry mappings, which is the foundation for the SEMRAX project this year, with which I'm involved, uh, with uh, Yvonne and uh, Jean-Baptiste and also Rashida uh, and Caroline. Uh, and so uh, these mappings actually play a central role and tend to be a little bit neglected in terms of the mathematical and software foundations. So the idea is that any archetype component, d for a value of parameter nu, which relates to geometry, say, is a mapping, curly t nu, of a reference spatial domain associated with a particular parameter value. And furthermore, the archetype component ports, I will assume that all components have two ports. They could have more. These are the mappings from a fiducial a port, which I indicate here. So in some sense, we have, for our particular library, two fidu fiducial ports, this fellow as well as the annulus that you saw earlier. For each uh, reference spatial domain, for each archetype component, we map this, this port to the associated port on the archetype component. That ensures geometric compatibility. And then we can vary the shape of this system through this all-critical mapping curly T nu. We then associate each archetype component to reference finite element mesh, which you actually saw on the previous slide, and an associated, say, P1 or P2 uh, finite element space of dimension curly N Fe for finite element. And a key point is that we require that for any V in this finite element space on local port 1 or local port 2, that the restriction of our function V and XH to the port 
is uh, given, is in the span of a set of fiducial port modes associated with each port type. And that assures functional conformity as well as geometric conformity when I connect two different uh, components. So key point here is that the chi are port modes that represent the finite element functions on the two ports of the component. The finite element space for a model is then just the direct sum of all the finite element spaces on all the little instantiated components. Of course, intersected with x, which provides the necessary, which is h10, say, which provides the necessary continuity. And then we proceed with standard Galerkin projection. We actually never form this finite element system, but that is the underlying truth approximation to which we then apply model reduction in order to accelerate the app response. All right, so now we take that formulation and we apply static condensation, which dates, again, it's a roughly uh, more than 50 years old. It's a very standard technique in structural analysis, as you can tell from that static adjective. Uh, it also has a very nice mathematical formulation. You've probably seen it before, even if you haven't seen that term in terms of a sure complement. Uh, so this is the procedure in our context, in our language, in a given instantiated component. So remember, my horn had 20 instantiated components. So I now look at each one of those components separately. And for each of its two mode, port modes, I'm sorry, for each of its two ports, remember a port on one side of the bend and on the other, and for each port mode J on each of those two ports, those are the finite element functions on the ports, we create a function psi, which is the lifting of the port mode into the interior of the reference domain, and then a function phi, which is this lifting plus a bubble function, eta, which such that phi actually satisfies the finite element equations in the interior of the component subject to the port boundary conditions. That is, this phi is actually a harmonic lifting of chi such that the equations are satisfied in the interior. So once I have these phi functions, I know uh, that, well, let me first actually provide a brief detail. So these, these bubble functions, right, because these already satisfy the boundary conditions, these eta's are bubble functions. They satisfy the weak form of the PDE in the interior. And I just indicated here, so you can see it's very standard stuff. These are the finite element coefficients. K is the index associated with the finite element, say, nodal basis functions. This is the system of equations satisfied. These are the standard uh, weak form associated with the acoustics uh, Helmholtz operator. And this is a system of curly N Fe by curly N Fe, uh, of system of, uh, of size curly N Fe by curly N Fe. So if I have those bubble functions, then I can form these uh, sort of, if you like, Green's functions or solutions of the PDE in the interior. That means that I can represent the solution in the interior by unknown coefficients times these phi functions, because these phi functions, by construction, satisfy the equation in the interior. And once I have the solution in the interior, I can form a stiffness matrix, which relates the normal velocities on the local ports and port modes to the pressure on the local ports and port modes. This is a standard next step in domain decomposition. And in our particular case, the stiffness matrix, as you would expect, takes the form of the bilinear form, trial function, I'm sorry, test function, trial function, test function, trial function. And you see that it's rather special because the bubble function enters into this stiffness matrix because they're ad hoc functions that actually satisfy the partial differential equation. So now I have a stiffness matrix at the level of the component in terms of port degrees of freedom. And I now require continuity of pressure, weak continuity of normal velocity. That's a standard procedure in the software context of direct stiffness. I take my little elemental, I'm sorry, component uh, stiffness matrices. I stamp them into a global sure complement, similarly for the force. And I find at the end a block sparse sure complement, uh, solution of which will yield the full finite element solution in terms of the degrees of freedom on the port. The two issues with this technique, which is why in its native form it's not used uh, at present, is that its size will be large. This is the number of global ports, which may be small, say 10 or 20, but this is the number of degrees of freedom uh, on each port, which could easily be in the hundreds or, or potentially even many hundreds, because these are two-dimensional surfaces for three-dimensional components. And furthermore, uh, not only will this system be uh, uh, large and therefore costly to invert, it will be very costly to form. And why is that? Well, remember that this is assembled from these stiffness uh, matrices associated with the components. The stiffness matrices with the components have bubble functions, and the bubble functions for each 
uh, component and for each port and for each port mode, in other words, thousands of them, each satisfy an equation which corresponds to a large finite element system within the interior of the component. So it's very expensive to form and it's very expensive to solve. So the idea is to apply model order reduction and it's a very simple idea that's largely explained by this slide and then I'll fill it in with a few details. So remember before, in, in a given instantiated port and for each local port and port mode, I created some uh, a lifting and then some uh, uh, bubble functions. Well, I do the same, except now I truncate the number of port modes at M. M will be in the examples I give 11, whereas JFE would be on the order of several hundred. And furthermore, I replace the bubble functions with approximations derived from a reduced basis space with n degrees of freedom, where n will typically be on the order of 20 to 50 compared to curly n, which can easily be on the order of 100,000. So there are two levels of model reduction here. The first is I truncate the representation on the port of each of the components. The second is that I look for an approximation to the bubble functions in a low dimensional space tailored to each component, each uh, port and each port mode. But I should emphasize that this one space will uh, serve all archetype components, and as all instantiations of a given archetype component. So let me just mention that these coefficients in front of our new, uh, uh, the coefficients associated with our new uh, bubble functions, uh, this is the, these are the basis functions of my reduced basis space. They satisfy a system of n by n equations, so much less expensive than before. So I now uh, can assume that these are relatively inexpensive and that I have relatively few port modes. Uh, I can now represent the field in the interior of the component, instantiated component, in terms of unknown coefficients times these approximate solutions to the PDE. I then can form a stiffness matrix as before, but now notice that these are approximate bubble functions that will be much less expensive to compute. And I can then assemble them in an approximate sure complement. And the sure complement is much smaller because I only retain 10 port modes, say, compared to several hundred. And it's much more readily computed because these bubble functions, which are solutions of the PDE, are approximated with a, an, an ad hoc, in the positive sense, reduced basis space tailored to that particular function in parametric manifold, as I'll describe shortly. All right, so uh, why should this work? Uh, this, is, this would work if M and N were small. Why should there be only a few port modes for a complicated acoustic system? Why should there only be, say, 20 or 30 modes needed to approximate these bubble functions, the solution of the partial differential equation? Well, let me treat first the port reduction. Uh, and why should M, the number of port modes that I actually need to represent the function, be much less than the number of finite element degrees of freedom? Well, I consider a simple waveguide. P here is pressure. I impose G, and I require that I have a bounded radiating wave at infinity. Outgoing, I'm sorry. And I introduce the Eigen system associated with the uh, cross-stream, uh, cross-plan form as epsilon and lambda, eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. And I can then write explicitly, this is classical separation of variables, the solution. And you will see that for a typical wave number, there are only very few propagating modes, and all of the other modes in the system decay. Those are known as evanescent modes. That's a classical result in acoustics. And of course, if you don't have acoustics, there's no K. And of course, that's just the elliptic equation, the decay of modes uh, by separation of variables. And what does that say? So that says if I have a, a system, and I look at one particular port, all the information coming from nearby and afar is all filtered before it arrives at my port because I have most of the modes which are decaying and only a very few which propagate. So that implies that in fact I should be able to find a low dimensional space on which all of the restrictions to the port reside. All right, so how do you actually find that? We have several methods. I'm going to show the simplest, most intuitive here. We go through all pairs of archetype components and let's denote the left fellow left and the right fellow right. So this is a side hole for a musical instrument. This is a duct, uh, left and right. And I have a left and a right port, which is exposed. And I have a port on which I am going to collect data. How do I collect the data? I solve the PDE of interest over this domain with a rich set of Dirichlet conditions, left and right, and a rich set of admissible parameters in these two domains. I collect on this port of interest all of the restrictions of the solution in a set S, and I then apply a POD. 
Right? So that's the sense in which the dimension is small, and that's the sense in which we're able to find that low dimensional space. All right, how about the uh, bubble uh, reduction? Why do I need a low dimensional reduced basis space rather than a high dimensional finite element trace space? Well, for any archetype component to the library, for any local port, and for any local port mode, I remind you that eta is the harmonic lifting into the reference domain of the port mode, namely the solution to the PDE. Now, that resides in a high dimensional space. But it also resides in a low dimensional smooth manifold because we're only interested in parameters new that lie in a compact domain curly V. And why is this a low dimensional space? An important point to note that relates to the SEMRAX project is that all of these solutions for any value of the parameter, for any instantiations of this component, uh, are registered on a common reference domain. And that's what ensures that if you have a sharp domain, although the solution, say, at the corner may not be regular, if as the corner moves, all the solutions are pulled to a reference domain, then in fact the smoothness is embedded in the manifold. All right? So that's a key point uh, for the approach. And uh, I'd also like to point out that typically a component only has a few parameters, say V, say three or four. The model may have hundreds of parameters. And so in some sense, a typical problem with reduced basis methods is too many parameters. And with components, you basically divide and conquer. How do we find this space? Uh, for each archetype component, for each local port, for each port mode, uh, we form this uh, reduced basis space as a Lagrangian snapshot space. That is, we sample the solutions for different parameter values, take the span, for quasi-optimal parameter values uh, that correspond to different new in the uh, parametric domain associated with that archetype component. These are selected by a reduced basis, if you like, weak, greedy procedure. Uh, the first reference to that is a paper with uh, Karen Veroy and uh, Christophe Houdon, in fact. And uh, if I recall correctly, I would say that probably the first person to propose it was indeed Christophe. Uh, that has subsequently become very popular and in fact now is on a very firm theory, uh, thanks to a number of different groups who have shown that you get close to Kolmogorov end width with these kinds of techniques. Uh, remarks? Optimality. Uh, so I just uh, foreshadowed that first result. Under certain hypotheses, uh, the best fits associated with the port reduced spaces and the bubble reduced spaces convert, converge at rates similar to the corresponding Kolmogorov M or respectively N width. So the spaces have good approximation properties. Of course, that's only half the battle. The other half of the battle is stability. Uh, and the Galerkin projections are, of course, optimal, but only to with in a model and discretization dependent stability constant. All right, and I'll, I'll come back to that point uh, shortly. So that's the first uh, remark. Second remark is verification and validation. So we do exploit a posteriori error indicators uh, in order to choose optimally our snapshots and choose them efficiently, and also to choose the discretization cutoffs, M and N. But the first point is that these are not rigorous a posteriori error bounds. They're error indicators, so they cannot necessarily serve in verification. So how do we uh, verify? Uh, well, each model is verified over usually a subset of the model parameter uh, domain. Uh, we con uh, confirm H, M, and N in terms of refinement studies, decrease H, increase M, increase N. Uh, we refer to appropriate closed form approximations and we compare to third party computations and experiments. I would also like to say that the library uh, notion is to a certain extent uh, socialist in the sense that each model that you uh, develop and you validate and verify, those same components serve in other models. So in fact, the library as a whole converges because as you improve one model, then all the others in fact uh, are also improved. And we see that effect. In the first two weeks when we get a new library, we find all sorts of problems and slowly over time we find less and less problems as we increase M and N or choose different optimal parameters and choose different functions. All right, computational procedure and then I'll turn to the examples. So the offline stage, at present this offline stage for the particular problems I will present is performed in a factory in Ho Chi Minh City, not a real factory, a, a virtual Lego uh, factory. Uh, and what is prepared in that, uh, in that uh, stage offline? Well, we form the online data set. Uh, archetype component reference meshes are constructed. 
uh, we identify, or they identify the mappings, which allow us to proceed from the reference domain to a wide family of parametric uh, geometric variations. We uh, find the optimal set of port modes. We find the optimal reduced basis spaces. And we've, uh, we identify parameter independent inner products, which we store in D. Now, one last detail, and that's the final for the talk. I, I just wanted to point out that the stiffness uh, matrix at the component level for the reduced basis and port reduced system takes this form. And you'll notice this depends on parameter, which would make it quite expensive to form. But I can express this in terms of parameter-dependent coefficients, real numbers or complex numbers, times uh, parameter-independent basis functions. So you see that we could pre-store this quantity offline and then form it online as a simple sum. But not quite, because you'll notice these geometric transformation factors uh, uh, depend on the geometric parameters u, nu, and for that reason, we need to apply a second EIM expansion to represent these in affine form. So that's the final little bit in order to make all the pieces work uh, quickly in the online stage. So that's the, uh, that's the offline stage. Note, we never form a model in the offline stage, only pairs of components. So the system can be of size 10 million and we'll never see it. Uh, because we only get to models later, and all models that we subsequently form and evaluate can amortize this effort. It's not just one model, but it's literally hundreds of models. In the online stage, uh, implemented in a, in a cloud context, the user Im inputs the parameter. We then synthesize the model uh, from uh, a script, and that's done by a model server, which is created in the offline two stage. For each model in the offline two stage, we prepare or script the app, which is then uploaded as a server. Uh, once the model server specifies the, program, uh, the problem, this is sent to the compute server, which invokes the online data set, forms and solves the sure complement, calculates the field and output, and downloads and displays the solution. So that's the entire process. All of this resides in the cloud, uh, and is, all of it is through a web user interface, which is effectively a browser. All right, so uh, on to the uh, examples. And I will start, uh, let's say, I will, I will first, I've included a demo uh, because, uh, uh, just because it may fail, and, and that's, uh, it adds some element of excitement. Uh, but, but I will also have a self-contained set of results that are more scientific. So the first result is a flanged exponential horn. Uh, horns can be flanged or unflanged. A flanged horn is one like you have in an audio speaker where it comes out and there's a wall behind it. Unflanged is the case like a musical instrument where the sound goes everywhere. Right? So this first one is a flanged exponential horn. I introduced that earlier. And uh, the, you can see the parameter domain is quite extensive. And what I show here is just one result from the PDE app. This is the uh, throat impedance, which is how you characterize horns in audio systems to determine their, or one of the ways. And what I show here, the app is in red, and previous boundary element calculations are in blue. These also agree with experiment. This is therefore both verification and validation. These, uh, you notice that the wave number here relative to the mouth goes up to 10. That means there are many wavelengths all right, per uh, unit length in the axial direction, therefore difficult calculation. This is actually what the pressure field looks like at the outlet, and this is the far field calculated in terms of a spherical harmonic expansion. And again, these three lines are previous experiment, computation, and our results. And this is uh, measured in dB, all right, which is a logarithmic scale. So each unit here uh, is, is about 10% uh, error. Okay, So you can see even for very small pressures way out here, the accuracy is good to within 5 to 10%. All right, next example is an expansion chamber. This is a very crude form of a muffler. You have an inlet duct, you have an expansion chamber, then you have a, a contraction down to an uh, exit duct. We can vary many of the parameters. I show here a comparison between the PDE app for the transmission loss. Transmission loss large means noise small. All right, so ideally you want infinite uh, transmission loss. That means that no sound is radiated out at the other end of the muffler. All of it is reactively reflected back. These are non-dissipative uh, mufflers, not, not resistive uh, mufflers. And what you see again is the PD app in red compared to previous boundary elements and also previous experiments. Uh, at this point, the solution becomes non-planar right after this resonance, and we still agree with the experiment. I don't know what happened to the boundary elements, but they didn't seem to make it through this transition. But in any event, we still agree with the experiment. And this is an example of what the pressure looks like inside the muffler. It is no longer a plane wave. It has radial dependence. 
All right, the next example I will do uh, as, a, as a demo. En principe. All right, so the first thing that can fail is that the server has gone down. All right, so what I've done here is I've actually, in order to save a little pre-processing time, I've cheated, I actually already launched the, uh, the PDE app server, which is the server that knows how to specify this particular app, and this particular app, ah, oh, that was not good, sorry, let me, well, actually, let me go back. Uh, I'll show you down here, actually. So this particular app, is an acoustic bend. I have velocity at one end, imposed, zero velocity at the other end. The parameters that I can vary with this app are indicated here. There's the pre-length before the bend, the length after the bend, the ratio of the bend radius to the duct radius, the bend angle from 30 to 180 degrees, uh, the wave number, which can go up to the first appearance of three-dimensional uh, modes at the inlet, and the velocity boundary conditions. So I now ask the system to solve this particular case, uh, but I'm not going to do that because Fung, who writes this software, has lots of tricks, so he caches things. So if you happen to ask for one of the parameters that you've asked for, say, in the past day, he stored them somewhere in the cloud. So it looks like the software is much faster than it actually is. Right? So, so in order to actually gauge time, so, so uh, Madei, do you want to give me a, a bend angle between 30 and 180? 72. Oh, it can't do 72. <laughs> All right, 72. All right, so I say update model. It says solving, and it's solved in the time you just saw. All right, so it solves 200 partial differential equations in 3D for, th for 200 different wave numbers, and then calculates the inlet impedance, and then downloads the pressure field for one of those wave numbers. All right, so that happens all in the time indicated. And if you go to the bottom, that looks like, that looks roughly like 72 degrees or so from the other. And uh, you see the bend, and what you also see is that, in fact, the flow, not the flow, the acoustic field becomes three-dimensional because you excite three-dimensional duct modes in the process of taking that turn. And at the bottom, you also have the results of the 200 uh, wave numbers. I can ask to see, for example, the inlet impedance, and this is the imaginary part in green, which corresponds to the resonances in that system. Right? And so then you can query for different values of the parameter, and, and there's also a variety of ways to visualize the solution on different planes, uh, and all of it is intended to give you on the order of five-second turnaround all right, for each of these results. And so that demo worked, and I did not even cheat because I did not take advantage of the caching. All right, so I think that's reasonably, I wouldn't say completely honest, but reasonably honest. All right. So is the answer right? So again, uh, let me show a result for this same problem. So this is the geometry. These are the parameters that we can vary, sweep angle, ratio of radii, pre-length, post-length, and wave number. Uh, you just saw this little demo, by the way. The first page I did not show is where you pick the PDE app you wish to solve, and that invokes the right server, and that brings you to the next page, which is what you saw, and that brings you to the solutions. Okay. Uh, this is a comparison with experiment and prior theory and, in fact, prior computation. This is the inlet impedance as a function of frequency. And uh, what you see is the PDE app in red, and it falls very close uh, to the blue dots, which are the theory, but it falls even closer uh, to, the, uh, to this red line. I'm sorry, the green and the red, and that's actually experiment. And you see these lines that look like they're unrelated. This is if I take that, that bend in the duct and I straighten it out and take an effective length straight duct, you can see that you miss completely these resonances. And you even, in fact, miss a low resonance, which is one of the reasons why people know that bends in musical instruments have a non-trivial effect on the inlet impedance. Not necessarily on the reflection coefficient, but it's the inlet impedance, which is what's felt by the reed or the lips, and it's the interaction of that nonlinear system that generates the, the sound that you hear. And so this is the crucial function that serves in that capacity. And if you get it wrong, of course, you'll get the wrong sounds. All right. And there's the visualization with a fully three-dimensional uh, pressure field. This corresponds to roughly half a million finite element degrees of freedom. The response time, including the download from the net, 
and, and Fung uses a number of parallel download tricks as well as parallel processing in the cloud. Uh, there's a feature by which you can send different sets of wave numbers to different machines on the cloud and therefore get the result that much quicker. In this particular case, the response time is 8.4. We were shooting for five. On the other hand, we got 200 PDEs, so perhaps you'll uh, provide us with a little, little slack. All right, so this last example has the slide which probably is the most interesting of the talk, which you may think is, doesn't have much competition, but nevertheless, it's potentially the, the slide which uh, merits most attention. So this is an expen extended tube uh, expansion chamber. This is what most even simpler mufflers have, at least this structure, where you can see that the tubes come into the chamber left and right. And these can, uh, the lengths can be tuned in order to provide much better reactive muffler uh, re, uh, reflection of waves. And of course, it's interesting numerically because there are a lot more parameters. So uh, we've also created an app for this. Uh, the, uh, the black dots are experiment. Uh, the red is the PD app, and the dash blue here is boundary element. Uh, you'll notice that the PDE app actually does better than the boundary element, and the reason is we have 10 to the minus 5 dissipation. The boundary integral has, boundary element has zero. The real physical system has somewhere in between the two, but you'll notice that some of these dips are characteristic and shifts of a slight bit of dissipation, which in this case is almost or more realistic than no dissipation, if the dissipation is sufficiently small. All right, so uh, this is effectively the end of the talk. I'll show you one example and then a few pictures. But what I wanted to comment here was that, so this is a result. We had the result. We compared with experiment. It compares beautifully. And I was idly trying another case with the PDE app uh, for this same configuration. You can't see the tubes inside. And this was the result that I obtained. Right? So this is two-dimensional inlet, axisymmetric inlet, axisymmetric outlet, axisymmetric geometry three-dimensional pressure field. Right. So the first thought, the more benign thought, right, is that this is a physical instability. There actually are duct modes in 3D which have resonances earlier right, than uh, axisymmetric duct modes. Their cutoff frequency is, in fact, lower. So what could have happened if this was a physical instability was that there actually is a resonant mode present, but it's 3D, a little bit of numerical noise, then stimulates the result that you see here. So this would not be a physical result, but it would be a result which is physically relevant because it's indicating that there is, in fact, a nearby resonance. All right, so next what I did was I actually went in by hand and I asked for a different number of components in this gap. So this is the same problem on the right. All right, same physical parameters, but a different discretization, and you see that the 3D effect has disappeared. So now the question is, why is that? And there are two possible reasons. One is that it could still be true that there's a resonance nearby, but there's less uh, perturbation in the third direction, if you like, due to the solution algorithm in this case. We don't see it. Uh, or it could be that this is more of a numerical instability than a physical instability. And so how do we distinguish between those two? Well, a physical instability just means that the imp soup gets very close to zero, except perhaps for a small dissipation term. And that could certainly give rise to a system like this. What do we mean by numerical stability? We would mean that the imp soup of our discretization is greater than the imp soup of the finite element. So it would be possible that uh, I could have this instability because the numerical imp soup, if you like, goes to zero, uh, in, in which case this could be entirely spurious, or it could be that simply that the imp soup is, is relatively small and I'm seeing the manifestation of that instability. So the obvious thing to do, and we have not yet done it yet because this is a large commercial code, is calculate the imp soup uh, and, and to look at that compared to the finite element. And if the finite element is very small, then we're seeing a stimulated 3D effect, which is in some sense real. If the finite element is much larger imp soup than the actual computational, then we need to work on new training and projection techniques. Okay? All right, so that is really the, the, uh, the point that requires more subtle analysis. Otherwise, I think the apps I've shown you are in pretty good shape. You can also uh, treat problems in linear elasticity. This is a family of shafts, and you can make shafts with notches, with fillets, uh, with grooves, uh, with holes that are through holes for various reasons, for cotter pins, say. Uh, these are uh, typical solutions. You see stress concentration factors, which we've confirmed are accurate typically to within a few percent. Uh, these are the components from which you can make these shafts. In each, we solve the equations of linear elasticity with ports as indicated in blue and red. 
Uh, we then have these archetype components, which we can form into a system uh, by essentially the same fashion as in acoustics. We then coalesce the ports to get our system and then the underlying stitched together finite element mesh. So you can see that now this is a real shaft from a design handbook. This is the model we can form. Uh, these are the breakdowns into components. And then these are the axial displacements and various stresses. So now you have a design tool which takes a matter of seconds in order to analyze three-dimensional linearisticity for these kinds of shaft systems which share a common set of engineering components. And last example are what architects call lintels, but we think of more commonly as arches. So here we can think of having historic structures that either have Roman arches or Gothic arches. Uh, we could have beams, or we could also have, uh, for the modern era, I-beams. And we could then form from these uh, systems, gluing together as before. Uh, an example of a component is the I-beam, which I've shown here. Uh, here are the components with all the different colored ports. And that allows me to form, say, this Roman arch or colonnade, as the architects call it, uh, from these uh, three components here, uh, combined in the fashion uh, shown. So that's uh, an example of application. I showed you three different physical domains. Uh, I tried to illustrate how they're all put together in an app context and finally give you some sense of the numerics that's uh, under the hood uh, that allows us to get these five-second turnaround for finite element problems that sometimes have many, many million degrees of freedom. Thank you.